Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to provide an update on the Stark decision. Now, if you recall, that was the decision finding the provincial court does have jurisdiction to hear the reviews of the nullification letter that went out uh, with respect to firearms, particularly AR-15s. So uh, that was the decision of Judge Fradsham. It's a very well-written, in my view, very well-reasoned decision. Uh, but unsurprisingly, the Attorney General of Canada is not happy with it. And so we see that they are taking it up to the Court of Queen's Bench and they are sending in a notice of appeal. So they want to fight this decision in Queen's Bench. This was filed just January 4th, 2021. So basically just as soon as the courts reopened. Uh, we see here that the scheduled date is Friday, April 30th in courtroom 1202. Uh, that's in Calgary. And summary conviction appeals. It looks like it was initially that they put down justice in chambers, which is not the right place for this. But there's some reasons why they might try to do that. And I can sort of comment a little bit on that. There are some comments I'm going to keep to myself on this one. And the reason why is that I've got a separate Section 74 hearing. But also, I don't really want to provide anything that might help them out in terms of this. So if there's places where I think they are making a mistake that, you know, that might gain somebody advantage, I'm not going to talk about that here. And I'm sorry, but uh, I feel like this is uh, more important than my YouTube channel. So there's some things I'm going to keep to myself. I, I'm sort of sorry that I can't provide that information, but you got to think tactically when the court is involved. So let's, uh, let's dive into the stuff I can sort of explain and talk about. So the first thing here is where it says basis for the appeal to be put before the court. They're saying, you know, these are the reasons for why this is challengeable. They're saying these are the mistakes that they think that the court made. And again, this is the view of the attorney general. This has not been tested at all. This is just a notice of appeal. This is the starting document that creates that challenge. So saying the Honorable Judge Fragium erred in determining first that the Provincial Court of Alberta has jurisdiction to hear the respondent's application. Uh, second, that the letter constituted a decision revoking the respondent's uh, firearm certificates pursuant to Section 71.1 of the Firearms Act. So they're saying that the letter wasn't a decision. It was just a notice. It was just, you know, here is a thing that happened and we weren't involved in any way, but we're letting you know that it happened. Uh, three, uh, they're saying that the judge made a mistake by determining that the respondent's certificates remain valid following the May 1st order in council. So their position, again, is that uh, the certificates just evaporated like fairy dust, that uh, this was not something that the registrar did, that this was just something that happened automatically in law. Of course, there's not really a provision that they can point to that causes that automatic revocation. There's a number of sort of automatic revocation provisions, but none that applies to this in particular. That was one of the things that Judge Fradsham found, and in my view, quite correctly. Uh, their view is that because it says you're not, uh, you know, you're not eligible to hold a registration certificate, that that means that it's automatically cancelled. However, that not eligible language is also used, for instance, if you're a danger to the public, which is clearly a situation where a Section 74 review is available. So I'm not sure how that argument really stands up, but... That is their argument, and they've been successful, but so far, you know, not before Judge Fradsham, and it seems like their success has been in cases where they've been up against self-represented individuals. If you view court as a lawyer fight in the same way as, like, the OK Corral is a gun fight, it always helps to bring a lawyer for the same reasons that it helps to bring a gun if you're going to a gun fight. Uh, otherwise, it's sort of a little unfair. Anyway, uh, the respondent's application for a firearms reference did not constitute an abuse of process. So they're saying it does constitute an abuse of process, which essentially means that it was filed for, you know, bad reasons and it shouldn't have been. Uh, I don't want to go too much into abuse of process law and what that means, but that's one of the things they're suggesting here. And such further grounds as counsel may advise and this honorable court may permit. This is lawyerese. It's very common. Whenever you're filing a notice, you'll see several sections like this, and there's several in this one that basically say, if we didn't think of something, 
we still want to be able to argue it. So that's really what this means is if we think of something later, we still want it on the table. Uh, don't worry too much about this section. They go into every appeal. I'd put them in mine as well. So remedy claimed or sought. Uh, when you go before the court, it's important not just to say, here's what I think you know happened that is wrong, but you also have to tell the court, here's what I hope you will do about it. Here's what I expect you to do about it. And that remedy needs to be something that the court could grant because sometimes people go before the court and they're like, I want them to apologize. Well, courts don't grant apologies. But if you're going before the court, you know, say in small claims court and your issue is, you know, they damaged my fence and I want money for the fence. Small claims court is usually like, yeah, that we can do. The apology, not so much. Money we can do. So you have to ask for a remedy that the court uh, can grant. And this is part of why they want you to list the remedy that you want. So remedy claimed or sought. So first, that the judge, uh, Honorable Judge Fradsham's decision of November 30th, 2020 uh, be set aside. So they're wanting that decision canceled and thrown out. Uh, next, an order that the Honorable Judge Fradsham erred in determining, so made a mistake by determining that the Provincial Court of Alberta has jurisdiction to hear the application for a firearms reference of the, of the letter. Uh, next, that the letter constituted a decision. Basically, all of the things I went over before. So why am I going over them again? I'll skip over that. Basically, they're saying an order proclaiming that the judge made a mistake in all of those things. Uh, an order pursuant to Section 49 of the Provincial Court Act staying the operation of the decision of, the, uh, of Judge Fradsham. And again, such further and other relief as this honorable court deems just and necessary. That's another, if we didn't think of something, but you can think of something you want to give us, please give it to us anyway. So that's why that goes in there. Material or evidence to be relied on. So first, the record of proceedings in the provincial court matter. This is, of course, what they'll, uh, you always have to rely on that because, you know, when you're saying that the court made a mistake, you really need the proceedings at the lower court level. So that's the starting point. Uh, such further and other material as counsel may advise. So another, if we didn't think of something, but we do later, we want to rely on it. Uh, applicable rules is just talking about the law that they're viewing as applying to this and applicable rules and re or acts and regulations. So they're saying the rules of court, Firearms Act, various sections. Uh, in particular, they're talking about the eligibility sections here as well as the sort of notice and appeal sections. Uh, the regulations prescribing certain firearms. So they're saying, hey, that's why that, you know, this stuff is banned. Federal Courts Act, and this is because they're position is that this needed to go to federal court, not provincial court. Again, I think they're wrong about that. And the criminal code and the sections here they're relying on are the definition sections, the unlawful possession sections. So it looks like uh, essentially they're arguing, you know, they can't have this. This is not uh, proper. Now, a lot of people might be seeing this and freaking out, and I'm not that much freaked out because I expected that this would happen. As I've said before, I think that this issue is one that's on its way to the Supreme Court. Um, appeals are how it gets there. It's going to go through Superior Court, and regardless of whichever side wins, there's going to be appeals uh, to the Court of Appeal, and regardless of whichever side wins, I expect that there will be an application to try to get this in front of the Supreme Court. And I think this, the Supreme Court may well pick this up because of the simple fact that uh, we're getting different decisions out of different jurisdictions and it's a big issue. Um, I don't think it can be understated how big of an issue this is and how much this extends beyond the current letter that people have gotten. So now you might be saying, well, uh, you know, hey, Runkle, aren't you fighting this yourself? What happens if they win this appeal? And without giving away too much of my hand, um, I anticipated that they would bring this appeal. Of course, I had to contemplate the possibility that uh, Fradsham might have ruled the other way. So all of that I'm ahead of. I've, I've got plans for sort of how to deal with this. I'm not too worried at this stage. Um, right now, we're just... This is sort of the first... This is the preliminaries, even just the uh, the whole provincial court battle, because as I said, I think that this is going to be eventually in front of the Supreme Court. This is going to be a big deal. There's going to be a whole lot of uh, 
I expect there will be a whole lot of interveners because there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in this issue. This is going to be a huge, huge battle. And so I'm not too worried about the fact that it's turning into a huge battle because that's what I expected. That's what I sort of signed up for. And I'm looking forward to the fight. That's uh, the long and short of it. Uh, we'll have to see sort of ultimately what shakes out of this. But I'm hoping there's some potential here to make things better for uh, for gun owners to stop certain practices that I think have been uh, very unfortunate. Let's go with that. Uh, and that hopefully should be curtailed by the court if we get a strong enough and suitable decision. Anyway, I just wanted to provide this as a little bit of an update. Um, it's less of a big deal than it might seem, as as noted, but uh, I'm going to be following this one very carefully to see what happens. Um, hopefully the, uh, the Superior Court, when this lands on their desk, understands the seriousness of this issue and puts a lot of thought and care into it, because this is a big deal. Anyway, thank you for watching. I want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Demo, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Firearms Association, and Toronto Airsoft. At the $20 level, Cameron Johnson, Kevin Fleet, and Dale Nesbitt, as well as a number of you at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Uh, thank you once again. I hope I've armed you with knowledge, and if you have questions, leave them in the comments section below. Uh, I will note, again, there are some things I'm just not talking about here because I don't want to mess with ongoing litigation. That's not my, uh, my goal here. So thank you once again, and... Until next time.